Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Today we are going to journey back to the land of serendipity with a book that, as far as I know, is a one-off. It has no canonical prequels or sequels that I'm aware of. So today we are looking at Mumkin. You may hear me mispronounce it as Mumkin. That's how I said it as a kid. So this is Mumkin, M-U-M-K-I-N, as if you didn't already see it in the title and on screen, written by Stephen Cosgrove and illustrated by Robin James. Fear of losing what you have can rob you of the joy of sharing. Dedicated to two great men, together one day in Geneva they tried to see a world without borders of thicket and vine. The morning mists swirled and twirled in the hesitant breeze that always blew just after the sun had risen. They twisted in and about the gnarled old trees and stumps that surrounded the rippling grasses that seemed as a sea when the winds did blow. This place was called Middling Meadow. Middling Meadow was a wide and spacious land with natural borders of cedar and pine, meadow and mountain, and a twisty little stream. Hmm. Cedar and pine, thicket and vine. I'm starting to see a theme here. Very nice landscape picture. In Middling Meadow lived a herd of small horses, notice small, not miniature, who roamed freely from one side of the meadow to the other as they pranced and galloped about. For the land was open, and all the horses shared in all there was to share, from the sweet-tasting clover down by the stream to the honeysuckle vine that grew in great profusion in and around the aspen pine. That is a very nice illustration. The trees are nice. Especially like the pine trees in the very background. And the horses are very well done for a distance shot. Mm -hmm. Lots of horses, good variety of color, good variety of poses. Lots of energy. Mm -hmm. Living in this herd of horses was a pudgy little pony called Mumkin who lived to eat all that he could of the clover and honeysuckle vine. His flaxen mane rippled and flowed as he ran about the meadow in search of good things to eat. When he had eaten all that he could, he would drink deeply of the cold, sweet waters of the bubbling brook, then stand in silent slumber in a streaming ray of sunshine. So we have a herd of horses and a pony. Yep, they're very nicely rendered pony. I like how fluffy and full-bodied the mane looks. Mm-hmm. And he's definitely well-rounded. Text does call him pudgy. Mumkin felt that he knew where every succulent blade of grass grew in the meadow, and he was not about to share that with any of the other horses. So apparently pony and horse are interchangeable in this book. Whenever he was eating and another pony approached, he would lower his head, flatten his ears, and squint his eyes to scare it away. The other ponies usually squinted right back, unafraid, and meandered off to munch another bunch of clover or honeysuckle vine. So, yeah, I think pony and horse are interchangeable in this book. But that pony slash horse actually looks afraid. <laughs> or at least somewhat perturbed. Yeah. Like, what, 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 did I, what did I do? Yeah, well, it does say usually. That doesn't mean always. Yep. Mumkin hated sharing so much that he finally decided to do something about it. With his strong teeth, he began to drag sticks and twigs, branches and boughs from the forest. Pulling and tugging, he built a border of thicket and vine around what he felt was the most luscious part of the pasture. Seems he's doing a pretty good job of building a wall. He built his border higher and higher until none of the other ponies could even look in. Then, at either end, he built gates that only he could enter. Mumpkin paced his border, shaking his shaggy mane from side to side in great delight. Now, no other pony would be able to eat his luscious grasses. No other pony would be able to munch his sweet honeysuckle vine. This was his land, his very own part of the pasture. Mumpkin was very pleased indeed. A very nice rendering of a very... Pleased indeed, pony. Yes. Isn't this what early American settlers did? They went out, found choice pieces of land, and called it their own? Yeah. 
I have a feeling this isn't going to go well. Yeah, definitely not going to end well. Something's going to go wrong with the field, or the grass is greener on the other side. Stuff mm -hmm. along that line. That night, bathed in sparkling starlight and beams from a bright silver moon, he slept in peace and tranquility. Well, almost slept, for he had to remain alert just in case another pony attempted to cross his border during the night. Though none did, he could hear rustling outside his walls. Mumkin became so worried that he paced all night long, trying to see what was happening beyond his walls. But he could see nothing at all. For you see, that bad thing about borders is that you have to build them so high you cannot see beyond them. You don't have to build them tall. It could just be a marker. Yeah, sometimes it's just a marker on a map of my line's here. No, it's over here. This is why you get into disputes over how far the line is drawn. There's probably even disputes of how thick the line should be. Probably. The next morning, Mumkin woke just as the first rays of bright light stabbed their way through his border of thicket and vine. He looked quickly around to be certain no one had entered during the night. Sure enough, Mumkin was all alone. Every blade of grass was safe, and his and his alone. He kicked his heels and reeled about his private land, spraying rainbow showers of morning dew. He nibbled a bit of breakfast, then decided it was time to dash to the stream for a drink of water. So, after he made sure that his walls were safe and secure, he slipped through his border gate to go to the creek. You fenced off your land without a water source. Not a good idea. Yeah. Though it looks pretty happy. Yeah, it's a very nice picture. There's a rainbow, like it was described. You can see Dew being kicked up in the back there, him hopping around. Much to Mumkin's surprise, the pasture of the day before was now nothing but a series of borders of thicket and vine. For during the night, as he slept in his borders, didn't it just say he didn't sleep? Or not much? Yeah. He did also say that he heard a lot of noises as he slept. Mm -hmm. The other ponies had built walls of their own. Now there was no open space to roam free. Mumkin wandered around in circles, trying to find the stream. But in this maze, he could find nothing but border upon border. He tried over and over to slip through one border or another, but at each there was an angry pony with ears flattened, glaring and warning him back. And you can see another border in the background, you can see the glaring pony, and Mumkin being surprised. Mm-hmm. Amid the maze of borders, Mumkin could not find his own tiny land and was lost in walls of thicket and vine. Round and round he ran, then walked between and through the borders until finally he found himself on the narrow trail that reached to the very top of Midling Mountain. Didn't know we had a Midling Mountain. We were in Midling Meadow. Certainly, he thought to himself, if I get high enough, I will be able to spy my own borders. But no matter where he looked, he could see nothing that looked familiar. Finally, he climbed to the very top of the mountain, to the place where even clouds refused to go. Here he stopped to rest, for he was very, very tired. He looks it. Well, he hasn't even had a drink of water, and he's been running around all day trying to find his way to the stream or back to his own land. Preferably the stream, because he hasn't had a drink of water. Preferably. Mumkin looked down at all there was to see. He looked once, twice, and then again. For from this great height, he could see none of the borders that he and the other ponies had built. As far as he could see, there was only the middling meadow as it had been created, without walls, without borders. He stood there, looking for a long, long while, until the tears of regret for what he had done dripped slowly from the corners of his eyes. Nice angle. Very nice. This book is very well rendered. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's Mumkin looking down, and we're seeing it as though we're further down the mountain. Yeah, we're looking up at Mumkin. Mm-hmm. You can even see his tears falling down. Mm-hmm. What a fool I've been, he said as he reared in anger. We must all share this meadow together, says the greediest pony. And 
he raced down the steep rock path with his flaxen mane snapping like a whip in the wind. Nice. Right. Also apparently not tired anymore. Apparently. Tears streaming down his face, Bumpkin tore at his border of thicket and vine, scattering his walls into the wind. When the other ponies saw what he was doing, they too began to destroy the evil that they had created. Middling Meadow returned to the way it had been intended to be. Well, almost as it had been intended. For one gray, greedy mare had left up her border walls. She continued to peer out nervously, afraid that someone might sneak into her section of the meadow. And there she stayed as the others played, trapped by the fear of losing what she thought belonged to her alone. Tear down your borders of thicket and vine, creating a free world, yours and mine. That's a very nice image, but boy, was that message kind of... It, they kind of hit you over the head with a very large mallet. Very much, but I do like this final image of Mumkin grazing. Yeah. He looks very thoughtful. Yes, it's very nicely rendered. Very lovely. So? Yeah, they hit you pretty hard with this whole sharing thing. Never the best sharer. I'm okay with sharing. It's just this was also about, I'm thinking, political views from the time of, like, get rid of borders and you don't need them and as it was intended to be. and. Yeah, but it's kind of along um, John Lennon's Imagine. You know, he says, imagine there's no countries. It's easy if you try. Mm-hmm. Yeah, imagining is easy. Reality is hard. But that's the thing with this book is the front message makes it sound like it's only talking about sharing. Mm -hmm. But the borders that are put up and the fear and mistrust that this creates between all the ponies is much, much deeper than simple share your cookies with me because you have lots and I would like some. And I have asked nicely and you have the kindness of your heart have given me some cookies. This is more like this is my land, that's your land, you stay there. Yeah, this is really more a world without borders. And everyone share everything, which can be taken as communism. In a way. I'm not saying it is, just saying that also the despoiling of nature because they put the meadow back to the way it was intended to be. Uh -huh. So that could also be seen as an environmental message against construction and development because they took this meadow and turned it into a housing development mm -hmm. and then tore it all down because it was evil. It was literally called evil by the end of the book. Yes, they used the word evil they too began to destroy the evil that they had created mm -hmm. and Middling Meadow was returned to the way it had been intended to be also it's not intended just because nature did it doesn't mean it was intended to be that way nature's kind of random it has its rules and everything but it changes its mind all the time nature is rather opportunistic whatever works at the time yep I mean, the basic message of sharing is nice, and the basic message of being nice to one another. But looking at it through an adult lens, you kind of have a bit of, is the, is the term cynicism correct? I think that's a reasonable term. You have like this lens of all the things you've experienced in your life, and you go, yeah, in the real world, that's, you can dream for that, and I still hope for a nice world, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know that this would work. So let's take it on a smaller scale. Let's take, say, an apartment complex. And then let's take all the locks off the doors and allow everyone access to every building within the complex. Odds are that's not going to go over well. You noob. So that's another thing. There's no concept of privacy. There's only the togetherness of the herd. So this has been Mumkin, 
written by Stephen Cosgrove and illustrated by Robin James. What was the original copyright? Uh, looks like the original copyright was 1985. Hmm, what was going on politically in 1985? Yeah, they mentioned two people. In the dedication. Two great men. Together one day in Geneva, they tried to see a world without borders of thicket and vine. Hmm. Relating to the Geneva Convention, perhaps? Hmm. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, like, share, subscribe. We do have a playlist of the serendipity books that we've done so far. If you'd like to check out more by this specific author illustrator team, we do have other Ember's Reading Room playlists. Also, we have other playlists and other videos on all sorts of topics. If you really enjoyed this book and would like a copy for yourself, uh, look below for an Amazon link. Pretty sure this one's still in print. If it is, we'll try to find it for you. Just feel like going shopping? Check out the Ebates link. Sign up and get cash back for shopping at places you probably already shop. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thank you.